This is a video summarising all of the content taught in the third topic of AQA A-Level Chemistry. This is a physical chemistry topic that can be examined on any of the papers, and while a lot of it is familiar from GCSE, some of it isn't. And also, despite a lot of it having been covered at GCSE, it's still really poorly understood, and plenty of candidates lose marks for things that they would also have been penalised for at GCSE. So it's really worth doing some good revision of this topic. In the bonding topic, we discuss four types of crystal structure, which is the overall structure of the substance. Is it ionic, like sodium chloride, metallic, like magnesium, macromolecular, which you would have called giant covalent at GCSE, like diamond and graphite, or is it a simple molecular substance like ice? Unlike at GCSE, while we made distinctions between bonding types based on whether things were metals or non-metals, at A-level we appreciate that it's a bit more nuanced, and really we're talking about differences in electronegativity. Elements that have a large difference in electronegativity experience ionic bonding, and this involves electrostatic attraction between the oppositely charged ions in a giant ionic lattice. These substances are solid at room temperature because the strong electrostatic force of attraction requires such a huge amount of energy to overcome. It's likely that you may be asked to compare and contrast an ionic substance with a simple molecular substance, and we get that idea that because we've got stronger forces, it takes more energy to overcome them, and therefore we have a higher melting or boiling point. You could also discuss the fact that ionic substances can only conduct electricity when they're molten or aqueous. And the reason for that is that even though they have charged particles, i.e. ions, in a solid, they're not free to move. You definitely do not want to be mentioning delocalised electrons anywhere in a question about ionic bonding. You could be asked to produce a graphical representation of an ionic compound. I've ever only seen this asked where the cations and the anions are in a one-to-one -one ratio. So essentially what you want to do is to draw a cube and put one ion at each of the corners of that cube, and then just make sure that your cations and your anions are alternating in all three dimensions. You learnt at GCSE that all of the elements in group one make ions with a single positive charge. Everything in group two makes ions with a two plus charge. Everything in group six makes ions with a two minus charge. And all of the halogens in group seven make ions with a single minus charge. You're now also familiar with the idea that the transition metals have multiple stable oxidation states, and so they can make multiple different charged ions. And the oxidation state of an element is going to be indicated using Roman numerals. It's important that you're able to work out what the formula of an ionic compound would be. And in order to do this, you need to be confident in naming your compound ions, specifically the ammonium ion, which is NH4+, the carbonate ion, which is CO3 2 minus, the hydroxide ion, OH minus, the nitrate ion, NO3 minus, and the sulfate ion, SO4 2 minus. As we mentioned at the start, our understanding of bonding at A-level is a bit more subtle and nuanced than it was at GCSE. So we no longer have this strict binary between ionic bonding on the one hand and covalent bonding on the other. We now have a sort of continuum that goes from ionic bonding to ionic bonding with some covalent character to polar covalent molecules right the way over to our strict vanilla covalent bonding. So let's talk about what it actually means if a compound has ionic bonding with some covalent character. Our initial assumption when we find a compound that contains some metal atoms and some non-metal atoms is that it's following something called the perfect ionic model. Now, under the perfect ionic model, all of the ions in that giant ionic lattice are spheres. They're perfectly spherical, or we sometimes say that they're acting as point charges. And this basically means that the ion doesn't have any substance. It doesn't really have um, a shape. It's just a single point in space. And we also say that under the perfect ionic model, this compound is showing no covalent character. But the truth is that most ionic compounds have at least a little bit. Now, at GCSE, you focused on ionic compounds made from elements in group one and two and six and seven. And these are less likely to have some covalent character than things from, say, group three. So aluminium oxide is kind of one of the poster girls for an ionic compound that has some covalent character. So what is that covalent character? Well, basically, it's distortion of the electron cloud around the ions. So rather than having these perfectly spherical ions, we see the electrons around the negatively charged ion being drawn back towards the cation. Now, the more covalent character that um, an ionic compound has, the bigger the impact will be on both its melting point and its lattice dissociation enthalpy. If you're currently studying in year 12 rather than revising at the end, don't worry about that. That's thermodynamics and you'll meet it next year. 
Now, the interesting thing is that when a compound has some covalent character, its melting point is a little bit lower than expected, but its lattice dissociation enthalpy is actually a bit higher than expected. So what's actually going on here? Well, basically, our positively charged cation is drawing the electrons towards itself. And this is particularly likely to happen if we have a small cation, because if you think about it, if you have the same amount of charge spread out over a smaller surface area, then the charge density is higher. And that means that the smaller cation is able to attract electrons more strongly than a large cation with the same charge. So, for instance, um, lithium chloride has more covalent character than potassium chloride because lithium is a smaller cation than potassium is, even though they have the same overall charge. The second thing that increases the likelihood of covalent character is if we have a large anion. So the outer shell electrons on that anion, because it's large, they're less attracted to the nucleus because they're further away and they're experiencing more shielding. And therefore, it's more easy for them to be polarised and this electron cloud to be distorted. So this means that lithium iodide shows more covalent character than lithium chloride because iodide is a larger anion. And then finally, having a larger charge on either ion. So as I mentioned, aluminium oxide is kind of one of the poster girls for ionic compounds with covalent character. And part of that is the fact that we have this three plus charge on the aluminium. So you have a very large charge and that means stronger electrostatic attraction and therefore more polarization. In order to put these together to work out an ionic compound formula, we need to be thinking about the charges and then lowest common multiples. So if I was to take this ammonium ion here with a single positive charge and the sulphide ion here with a two minus charge, the lowest common multiple of one and two is obviously just two. So in order to get up to two positives, I'm going to need two ammonium ions. Whereas if I was going to do the same with the sulphide, I don't need to multiply it by anything because it's already two. So that tells me that when I write out the formula for that compound, I'm going to need two of the ammonium ion, but only one of the sulphide ion. Similarly, if I were to have some aluminium sulphate, then aluminium has a charge of three plus and sulphate has a charge of two minus. So the lowest common multiple of those two numbers would be six. And in order to get myself there, I would need two aluminium ions and three sulphate ions. So my final formula would be Al2 and then three sulphate, making sure that I use brackets. You remember from GCSE that a single covalent bond is a single shared pair of electrons, with double and triple bonds existing when multiple pairs of electrons are shared. You also learned in year 12 that a coordinate or dative covalent bond is one that contains a shared pair of electrons where both of the electrons have been supplied by one atom. For instance, the ammonium ion is produced when an ammonium molecule with a lone pair on the nitrogen is able to donate that lone pair to a proton that it picks up from solution to make the ammonium ion. You might also have encountered dialuminium hexachloride, which is made when one aluminium chloride molecule and another aluminium chloride molecule are joined together by two covalent bonds. This is a perfect example of where at GCSE we would have expected a metal and a non-metal to make an ionic bond, but here we actually see covalent bonding. Giant covalent substances contain thousands of atoms. This includes diamond, which makes four strong covalent bonds per carbon atom. Remember, there are thousands of these carbon atoms and therefore melting it is incredibly difficult and needs a lot of energy. Likewise, graphite also contains thousands of atoms, but these are made into hexagonal layers or planes, as we tend to say at A-level, which are able to slide over each other because there are no strong covalent bonds between the layers. Unlike the carbon atoms in diamond, the carbon atoms in graphite only make three strong covalent bonds per atom. This means that each one of those atoms has one electron that is not participating in a covalent bond, and these become delocalized. This leads to a weakened molecular force between the planes of the graphite, but it also means that graphite is very unusual for a non-metal in that it can conduct electricity, because those electrons are free to move through the graphite. Metals consist of a giant metallic lattice, which is made up of regular rows of positive ions and a sea of delocalized electrons. If you're asked to draw this, you should make sure that you're drawing at least six ions. There is a strong electrostatic force of attraction between these positive ions and the delocalized electrons. Metals are able to conduct electricity because the electrons that are delocalized are free to move and carry charge through the metal.
In a question about properties, the first thing you want to ask yourself is, is this comparative or is it just about one substance? If you're asked why A has a higher melting point than B, you need to be talking in terms of it having more energy needed to overcome the forces. But if you're just asked why does A have a high melting point, then you need to be saying it takes a lot of energy to overcome those forces. It sounds like a really pernickety thing, but it will cost you marks in the exam. The second thing you want to think about is what are the forces being overcome, which may or may not be the same thing as what type of bonding it has. If it's an ionic substance, then obviously it's a strong electrostatic force of attraction being overcome. But if it's a covalent substance, you need to think, is this a giant covalent structure, in which case the covalent bonds are being broken? Or more likely, are they asking you about a simple molecular substance, in which case it's the weak intermolecular forces that are being overcome? If I have two methane molecules here and I'm looking at why does methane have such a low boiling point, it's because the weak intermolecular force is being overcome. The strong covalent bonds inside the molecule are not breaking. Then if you're asked about electrical conductivity, you need to think, does this substance have charged particles? And if so, what are they? Please don't write about delocalised electrons if the question asks you about ionic substances. Then secondly, are those charged particles free to move? And this is where we need to think about the fact that ionic substances can't conduct electricity unless they've been melted or dissolved. We can think about electrons as charged clouds that repel each other. And in trying to get as far apart as possible, these can cause molecules to have different shapes. Remember, it's always the electrons that are repelling each other, not the atoms that they're attached to. When you're trying to decide what to call a particular shape, firstly, you need to consider all of the electrons regardless of whether they're lone pairs or bonding pairs. And that number of electrons is going to give you your basic shape. And then, particularly for tetrahedral molecules, you're going to need to actually name the shape based on the bonding pairs only. Linear molecules have a bond angle of 180. And watch out, because this one often comes up while you have something that you think has lots of extra lone pairs. But when you're naming it, it's just linear because it only has two bonding pairs. Then trigonal planar molecules have a bond angle of 120, and your basic tetrahedral has a bond angle of 109.5. Trigonal pyramidal has two different bond angles. There are two bonding pairs as far apart from each other as they can be at the top and the bottom, and there's a 90 degree angle between them and the three remaining bonding pairs, which form a sort of 2-2 around the middle, and the angle between them is 120, just like in the trigonal planar molecule. Then we have our octahedral molecule, which confusingly only has six bonding pairs of electrons, because the name is based on the eight faces of the 3D shape, and that has bond angles of 90 degrees. Then we should think about our alternative tetrahedral shapes. If we have lo one lone pair, then this is going to reduce the bond angle by 2.5 degrees, and we call that triangular pyramidal or just pyramidal. And then we also have our bent or nonlinear molecules like water, which have two lone pairs. So we remove two sets of 2.5 degrees to have a bond angle of 104.5. And the reason for that is because the lone pairs are going to repel each other more strongly than the bonding pairs of electrons. To describe differences in intermolecular forces, we need to be able to talk about bond polarity. Electronegativity is the power of an atom to attract the pair of electrons towards it in a covalent bond. I could say that fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine because it has fewer shells, so there's a stronger attraction between the nucleus and the bonding electrons. Remember, it's those bonding electrons, not just generic outer shell electrons like lone pairs. Now, when atoms differ in electronegativity, that will cause the covalent bond between them to become polar, and it's possible that this may lead the whole molecule to be polar if the molecule is not symmetrical. If you look at my diagrams on the right-hand side, here I have chloromethane with this one polar bond, and we have a delta negative on the chlorine to show that it's more negative, and, um, and that's the more electronegative atom, and the delta positive on the carbon at the other end. Chloromethane experiences permanent dipole-permanent dipole interactions between molecules of the same type, but if you look below that at the tetrachloromethane that I've drawn, even though those individual bonds are polar bonds, because the molecule is symmetrical, they cancel each other out, and we don't have a permanent dipole, permanent dipole force between the molecules. There are three different types of weak intermolecular force, but before we go into them, you need to understand that the strength of these forces have overlapping ranges. It's not the case that every single molecule that has hydrogen bonds between its molecules is going to have a higher boiling point than every single molecule with van der Waals forces. Something with very strong van der Waals forces could have stronger intermolecular forces than something with very weak hydrogen bonds. Say, if you consider a really big polymer, it's not polar, it just has van der Waals forces. But because it's so big and has so many electrons, those van der Waals forces are stronger than the hydrogen bonds that we see between water molecules. Our first and strongest type of weak intermolecular force are hydrogen bonds, and there are two crucial things you need to understand. The first is a reminder that this is a weak intermolecular force, 
we mean the force between the molecules, not the covalent bonds inside the molecules. The second thing is that this arises because of the difference in polarity between hydrogen and three key atoms, fluorine, oxygen and nitrogen. So for hydrogen bonding to arise between two molecules, they need to contain bonds that are polar between hydrogen and one of those atoms. It isn't sufficient for a molecule to have fluorine atoms and hydrogen atoms that are not bonded to each other. The second type of weak intermolecular force is the permanent dipole-permanent dipole interaction. And this arises when we have a non-symmetrical molecule that contains bonds that are polar, but not as polar as the ones that lead to hydrogen bonding. For instance, if you have carbon bonded to chlorine, that's a polar bond. And if it's a non-symmetrical molecule, that could lead to a permanent dipole-permanent dipole interaction between two adjacent molecules. The final type of weak intermolecular force is the van der Waals force. And this arises because of the random distribution of electrons around a molecule. The larger a molecule is, the more electrons it has, and the more likely it is that just by random chance, there's an unequal distribution leading to a temporary dipole on one molecule. And this then induces a dipole on an adjacent molecule. And the attraction between the positive end of one molecule and the negative end of the other leads to the van der Waals force. The larger a molecule is, the more likely it is that this arises, and the stronger van der Waals forces that molecule experiences. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you're now feeling a little bit more confident about the bonding topic of AQA A-level chemistry. If you did find this video useful, then let me know in the comments below, and also don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry videos coming soon.